Well, where we are is what, what you've summarized, that we have the decision of the ECOWAS authority, uh, and let's point out that only eight out of the 11 expected uh, heads of state uh, attended. The rest were represented by, you know, other senior politicians from those administrations. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they've taken a decision which reiterates once again the use of force, i.e. the intervention. And the additional step embedded in that decision is the activation of the ECOWAS standby force, as, as you said, which has now constrained the military chiefs to convene in Accra and I suppose together with the ECOWAS uh, standby force chief of staff to now begin to plan into detail the implementation of that ECOWAS decision. If you want to go into technicalities, this decision can only be executed not earlier than 30 months, sorry, 30 days. So anywhere from 30 days to 90 days for a number of reasons, primarily planning, and then primarily assembling the forces with the requisite capability. Well, the, the, the network dropped again. I've spoken with your producer to go off video and then talk via phone. So part of the question actually uh, was lost. Okay. But um, my sense is that the decision is just a decision. Its implementation is likely going to face uh, quite a number of um, challenges. One of the challenges that I think we need to avert our minds to, because if it doesn't happen, the intervention will, cannot take place. This is a question of obtaining the Security Council sanction. Because the intervention, the planning that they are doing. However, <clears throat> if that doesn't happen, the only option left will be for ECOWAS to engage through diplomacy and find an exit strategy which invariably will revolve around a transition that involves both the military and civilian elements within um, Niger. So it brings us back to the playbook that we've seen in Guinea, mm. that we've seen in Mali, and that we've seen in Burkina Faso. However, let's assume for some reason that ECOWAS obtains the Security Council mandate. Then we need to look at the different scenarios as to how easy or difficult or dangerous this intervention is likely to be. I think as we speak, the Nigerian embassy, <clears throat> excuse me, in Niger is under attack. I think you've just shown it, where seats are being carried and so on and so forth. Yeah. When the intervention, this violence might spread to ECOWAS citizens who are resident in Niger. And ECOWAS facilities, i.e. the embassies, other business interests of ECOWAS member states within Niger might all come under attack. That would then create a lot of humanitarian crisis or complexities. So we're going to have more refugees than less. Then, of course, this is going to offset the regional trade, especially around onions from Niger, cattle, goats, and so on and so forth. I am told, and I stand to be corrected, that the oil supply from Niger to Benin, assuming that it's flowing already, is stopped. Nigeria has cut off, uh, what do you call it, um, power, supply power supply to Niger. But Niger holds some, some options in its arsenal, some of which I have mentioned. But Niger can also stop the construction and then link up with Boko Haram and then run riot. These are the calculations that we need to factor in. We've not even talked about the, the geopolitics that will turn Niger into a proxy theater. And I think yesterday, assuming that that 
uh, clip that was circulating on social media is right. Russia is likely to intervene through Wagner. And then Wagner or Russia comes into conflict with Western uh, powers. And the, the consequences are going to be dire. So let's give diplomacy a chance. Yeah, I mean, uh, and as I, I've and, said, and can we're you, all... Can I, you talk about giving diplomacy a chance. And that yeah. was the question I was asking earlier, that if, if your sure. diplomacy hasn't yielded the results in Mali, Burkina Faso, in terms of getting the, the junta to hand over power back to civilian rule <coughs> to hold an election just yet. ECOWAS looks at that as empowering others, like Niger. And therefore, fear of, fear of contagion is one that is very real to ECOWAS. And that is why they've taken this step. And they make the point that they have to use this, draw a line in the sun using Niger as an example. Isn't that a justification for this uh, tough stance and a deployment force? Well, is that question still for me? Yes, it's for you, yes. Okay, I didn't hear part of it because the network dropped again. But let me say that the diplomatic option cannot be based on outcomes in seven days or ten days. And I can only give the example of Liberia. When Chastella invaded, which threw Liberia into a civil war narrative that Professor Kwesienin has mentioned, which is also clearly different from Niger. We started engaging, you know, let's say from January in 1990. And Ekomog went in, in August, September 1990. It took eight months. And even that, the diplomatic option still failed to yield results. From 1990 to 1994, 95, the state has a right to dictate how other member states live their lives. Otherwise, otherwise, we would have dictated to Cote d'Ivoire how to live its life when Ouattara was changing the constitution, or to Nyasimbe Fauri when he was changing the constitution, or to Kampuari when he was changing the constitution, or to Alpha Conde when he was changing the constitution. So you need to treat these, they are the reality. That is the, 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 the facts on the ground. That is the government of Niger. And you need to now treat them like that, engage them as equals. Mm. You see what I mean? And yeah. we haven't done that. Okay. So let, let, what should Ghana do? I mean, we are committed to the project. We have heard from our defense ministers say, if ECOWAS decides to go, we'll, we'll commit our troops to it. The questions have been asked about parliamentary approvals. But then implications uh, for Ghana, considering that will be placed at the center of this geopolitical conflict, Russia, the Wagner Force, and then the West, what would the implications be for us? And what should we do as a, as a strong voice within the ECOWAS bloc if we take away Nigeria? Well, first of all, I have challenges and difficulties around the defense minister's statement. But when he spoke, and since he spoke, we have not heard from the president. Defense ministers don't declare war. It is the president who should have first made a strategic statement indicating what I said elsewhere yesterday, that Ghana is strongly in favor of the intervention option. So giving the platform for the chiefs to meet, although I would have wished that they met in Abuja, where the ECOWAS standby force chief of staff is located at the ECOWAS commission rather than in Accra. Now, Accra's options are a bit limited. You know, I hear from other sources that Togo has reservations about the diplom uh, sorry, the intervention option. So assuming that the intervention goes ahead, Maybe Ghana cannot use land corridors through Togo into Benin and then into Niger, or through Togo Benin into Nigeria and to Niger. Our routes or access will then be the, the, the sea or the maritime route by which we still need to enter Niger and or Nigeria, or the air corridor. You see, the, the planning is only the planning to activate or implement the activation of the ECOWAS standby force. And what really is going to happen is that <clears throat> there is an ECOWAS standby force, 
which derives its legal basis from the 1999 mechanism. And then you go forward to the ECOWAS Complete Prevention Framework of 2008. But on paper, this force is only 6,500. Now, the force ratios that Professor Enin um, are there are minds to. We need three times the force of Niger. Now, my estimate of Niger is that the army alone is about 5,000 without counting the Air Force and then counting the Jondan, which are equally you know, powerful uh, structures. So we need about 15,000, 6,500 is short on the paper. So we need the numbers, but aside of the numbers, we need a coherent force structure that is balanced, you know, in terms of how it is organized, how it is led and so on. Then we need the capabilities, the air capability, artillery capability or combat support mm. on the uh, border with Sierra Leone in the jungle. So that kind of syndrome, the isolation, the fear that you're going to die will be telling on these troops. We need to find the money to pay them because we set a precedent that this is not a peacekeeping operation. But I'm sure that we we'll apply the peacekeeping model and then we need to establish allowances to pay them. Where is this budget going to come from under our current IMF, you know, imposed uh, limitations or restrictions? So these are things that I think all of us, not necessarily Ghanaians, but all the core citizens, must apply their minds to. The options are a bit um, dire. And giving diplomacy the chance doesn't mean that, you know, of course, ECOWAS's image will be tarnished. But didn't Obama draw a red line in Syria's sand? And when Syria crossed it, and Obama didn't respond. It happened. Mm. In Liberia, we struck about 14 agreements before we finally brought it to an end. 14, ceasefires, cessation of hostilities, Accra has about three, Akosombo, Abuja, Kotonu, you know, all of these. So the lessons of diplomacy show that it is not a very, you know, quick fix that because you are di engaging diplomatically, all of a sudden you achieve results. Mm -hmm. Let's come back to the diplomatic option because it is a less costly, less riskier, and it is the one that is likely to succeed, giving an exit strategy that is admissible, acceptable to all parties, i.e. Niger and ECOWAS. It is not about saving face. It's about saving lives and saving the integrity of ECOWAS. Indeed, in my scenario model, in which I did very, very hurriedly, somebody commented that, the option of the Bakhmut scenario should be, you know, labeled the Great Sahelian War. Mm. 